Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Paige Minnemeyer, Senior Editor at Fierce Healthcare, and I'd like to just kick things off by passing it off to our speakers to uh, briefly introduce themselves. Uh, Jacob, if you'd like to go first. Sure, thanks, Paige. I'm Jacob Ryder. I'm a family doctor, a former Deputy National Coordinator at the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT in, uh, at HHS, and currently I'm CEO of an organization called Alliance for Better Health in the capital region of New York, where we uh, work to improve the health of the underserved uh, Medicaid members and the uninsured. Hi, and this is Ashma Gupta. I lead our product and solution strategy for healthcare provider sector and Google Cloud. Um, ex Kaiser Permanente Digital Health Incubation Leader and uh, passionate about healthcare, open data, interoperability, and uh, really delighted to be here today. Great, thank you both. Uh, so much for joining us. Uh, just a quick reminder before we jump in, um, if you have any questions for our panelists, uh, feel free to submit them and we'll do our best to get to as many as we can. Um, so in kind of the segment that led into our, our panel, we had a pretty full picture of, you know, where AI and machine learning are being deployed in healthcare. Um, I think to kind of just kick off our segment, I want to ask you both to talk just a little bit about where you kind of see the challenges remaining and and the hurdles that, that the industry still kind of is facing in, in you know, allowing these technologies to proliferate. Um, so I'll kick it off, Paige, um, and, and I'll go a little broader answer, not just the light of AI and machine learning. Um, when we are working in my, in my role, I have this, um, I'm fortunate to work with a lot of leaders around the space and the industry is dealing with a bimodal approach. The bimodal approach meaning what to do today like present forward, what are the tools that we ought to be bringing to handle or navigate the COVID-19 crisis, but also future back, which is what is our vision post-pandemic? How, how will we lead in the post-pandemic world? So these two bimodal strategies are at work in parallel today. So present forward meaning bringing the tools and those tools, there's some applicability of AI machine learning today, especially we saw that during COVID like chatbots, conversational agents, which are multilingual, when call centers were really a pressure to alleviate the pressure we uh, saw industry deploy this chatbot as the first virtual contact. Um, and we saw that in the patient service, surveillance as well. But as you look forward, like future back, what is the three-year vision? And I think that's slightly hazy right now. However, in that vision, the AI machine learning are integral part of the overall healthcare um, portfolio. Jacob, I will be interesting to see your um, view as well. Well, I, I so um, as predictably, I agree with with much of of what you express, Ashima. I think that the the challenge for us um, to think, you know, uh, thinking about the, the the title of this conversation, right beyond right beyond telemedicine, I, I would rather look at this as as health, and tele is really just a one channel through which. Um, we work together to achieve health for the people that we serve. And of course, we include that within that ourselves, right? So how do we, as a, as, as a set of communities, um, mm -hmm. achieve optimal health, period? So tele or telehealth, telemedicine, whatever we call it, is just a conduit. Um, AI um, is one of many tools that could be leveraged. Um, as we learn from each other about what is effective and not effective, right? Um, yeah. I, was, I was in a conversation yesterday with a, a bunch of folks um, who are helping the federal government think strategically about how we do what they call patient-centered clinical decision support. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I observed that decision support is something that happens all the, all the time, right? Mm -hmm. Technology, it, we leverage technology to help people make decisions Ashima, your parent company helps us make lots of decisions, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uses AI in a lot mm -hmm. of that work. Um, there's another little company, I think they're called um, Amazon. Has anybody heard of them, <laughs> right? They provide extraordinary decision support, right? To an end that aligns mm -hmm. with their business interests, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how is it that when we align business interests, and this is perhaps the topic of a, of a very different conversation, right? 
when we align business interests and when business interests of organizations are aligned with better health, right, rather than more service, um, and we can look backwards um, using your, your framework, Ashima, and say, look, in the past, it was fully a fee-for-service industry, right? Mm -hmm. So the business interests of people like me with letters after our names, right, were more mm -hmm. service equals more revenue, right? Yep. And there were lots of opportunities for all of us to um, maximize revenue. But how do we align better health with the activities that organizations, um, companies are, are, are working in? And I think that's an extraordinary opportunity for us to start to leverage so-called AI, machine learning, deep learning, um, tools that help us pull together lots of information and then turn the knowledge that in, that information helps us to gather into action, right? And I think that's the sort of last mile that I would offer we, in most cases, haven't yet solved. Yeah, and I think looking at Google as a company, and I'm glad Jacob, you brought it up, Google's overall mission is pretty timeless, it's pretty simple. And it is to help connect world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. So when you tra translate that mission, and we do that in, in, in the area that I head and uh, lead from Google Cloud Healthcare perspective, our mission is to help enterprises connect their data, make it accessible. When you say accessible, it means open APIs, standards like Fire. Make it useful is how do you apply AI and machine learning to that data? Because healthcare is a data rich, information poor industry. Right? They're not looking for more data. They're looking for what are the insights, what is the information. And in page, I would even go further to say, yes, AI has a role, but underneath there's a lot of data wrangling the data platform and really making sense of all this data that has pr proliferated and will continue to grow, especially as the industry is taking the digital pivot. So um, many times I advise our, our kind of industry stakeholders, like AI is not like, you know, it's, it's not the destination. First you start with the data, the data platform, and then we'll get to AI, but oftentimes AI is like more hyped. Okay, it's a kind of pixie dust, can we bring AI into it? But it's a method to the madness, understanding the data, creating that digital foundation to get to AI is, is the natural course of action. And I'll, I'll offer, as I hear you describe sure. data, um, one more tiny piece and then I'll shut up, Paige, I promise. Um, I, you know, Asha, you, you, you talk about data and one of the challenges that I've seen many organizations um, have when they start to think about applying uh, AI machine learning um, in this industry, health, notice I didn't necessarily say healthcare, is the difference between information and data. Mm -hmm. uh, wherein, um, you know, many organizations, you know, your parent org uh, would be one, my example of Amazon would be another, um, historically have lots of experience with data right? Did somebody click on this? Did they see this image? Did they buy one of those last week? Um, did their email have such and such in it, right? That's data. Um, data, you know, we could think of data as being something that is transduced. Um, you know, it is, it, 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 it is an actual event that, you know, a, a machine or something transduced from reality. Whereas information is information, is something that has been interpreted by a human. Mm -hmm. And so we look at, at picking a random thing, problem lists in patients' medical records, mm -hmm. right? Um, well, these are, these are generally diagnoses that humans have applied. Um, and, you know, depending on which paper you read, about half the time incorrect, mm -hmm. right? So now if we're going to use, apply a machine learning algorithm mm -hmm. to information, half of which is wrong, mm -hmm. um, we've got a problem with the predictions that our, that our, mm -hmm. our algor algorithm will make. So I think this is one of the you know, giant piles of dog poo that, that I have seen um, AI entrepreneurs, engineers step in when they think that they can apply the principles that they used in sort of digital media, advertising, sales, and they're, they're super smart people, but they don't yet understand that health space care, notice I used two words, um, is very different from other domains because there is much more of this sort of loose and sometimes questionably accurate 
mm -hmm. um, sort of basis on which these algorithms will be applied. And that's actually kind of a, a great transition to a, a question we just got in from the audience. You know, you both just mentioned that AI is not really a, a magic bullet. There are certainly challenges related to it. Um, do you think there are examples, you know, in healthcare of maybe where this technology is a little overhyped and, you know, kind of the, the companies that are, are using it are maybe getting a little ahead of themselves, I guess, if you want to think about it that way. I, I, I won't say it's, it's, I think we are very early days for AI. Let's say it like that. We are really in the very beginning. We there is tremendous potential. Let's let's not kid ourselves. Like the sheer amount of the data that exists today, and when you think of where the industry is going, be it digital pivot, and we talk about beyond telemedicine, the way I look into telemedicine is not just the virtual visit, not just like a call that you and we are having here. But when you talk about remote patient monitoring, when you're talking about even high equity hospital at home type use cases, there'll be tons of data. There's a lot of talk about sensors when you talk about disease state, diabetes or congestive heart failure, just the sheer amount of data that will be generated. It is not humanly possible to for someone to keep looking at the data and glean the insights. So there's absolutely where AI shines, machine learning sign, where there's a human fatigue can we help there when you talk about radiologists or pathologists if you look into a typical ct scan as hundreds of images and a radiologist typically gets two to three seconds to really look into an image can so there are certain tasks which are machines are very good at and that's where the ai promises but again we're all learning it's evolving space and um so there is a pathway very early stages not a hype, here to say, here to be transformative, but it's up to us. Do you rush into it or we want to be thoughtful about where and how it can help assist humans? Oftentimes I'd heard like not so much now, but a few years ago, there were some claims being made, AI is going to replace the doctors. No way, right? So there's that misinformation and misunderstanding of AI where we have seen in Google where it helps us being assistive in, in healthcare, right? Can it assist and, and be a smart assistant, which is helping the physician looking over your shoulder, the examples like digital pathology, examples like diabetic retinopathy, where AI is able to do routine tasks much faster and help with the human fatigue. I think that's where I believe there's a lot of promise and, and Jacob will be interesting in your take. <laughs> well, so, you know, Asha, Mike, you're, perhaps you're talking about Vinod Kosla's 20% doctor essay, which um, I, I, I actually think I agree with much of what he says in that paper. And for those who haven't read it, um, who are in the audience, I, you know, Google it, uh, Vinod Kosla 20% doctor, and I'm sure you can find a PDF of it out there. Um, it's a little dated now, and perhaps Vinod, if you're watching, maybe it's time to, to, to do version 2.0 of that. Um, wh what he says in that, in that paper is um, that we're wasting a lot of our time, <laughs> right? Uh, and that's the emphasis of most of his position is that we have physicians and other, you know, uh, humans doing work that we needn't do. And I think in that way, I and Vinod would agree wholeheartedly with what you said. Um, it, and if we were able to do that, and I think to some degree, let go of our egos, mm -hmm. right? And to say, hey, you know what? Machines can do X and Y and Z better than I can. Mm -hmm. What can't the machines do? That's what's left for me to do. Mm -hmm. A machine can't listen to you and look you in the eye and, and express empathy, mm -hmm. right? That's, that is an important part of personal healing. A machine can't effectively motivate or, or um, you know, uh, con convey compassion that, that, is, that is necessary and I think an important part of, of helping others achieve health. So there's lots that the machines can't do. Um, there, to your point earlier, there, there is, there, there's extraordinary opportunity for us to leverage machines um, in many places, right? We, we don't do arithmetic all that well, right? Mm -hmm. 
So let's not trust humans to, you know, figure out exactly what the dosage of something needs to be to, you know, so long as we have the right inputs. And I think there are also many examples wherein if you have the wrong inputs, if you put in kilos, but you meant pounds, the machine's going to do a horrible job at that. But at the same point, you know, how can the machine look at what the person's weight was last time and say, oh gosh, right? This might be an error. And so catching errors are, are places where I think machines would also be effective. But Paige, I know you have more questions to ask us. Sure. Um, I think just kind of following up on, you know, you both have emphasized that we're really, you know, still really early days for this type of technology in healthcare specifically. I mean, do you think kind of the, the pandemic situation that we're in is really helping to, to further chart some of that course and help drive you know, the interest and adoption of, of some of these uh, tech options. So I'll start. <laughs> Jacob's not a yes. <laughs> you, can, you can pick it up uh, and or disagree. I hope we have a little fire here and we disagree a little bit. Um, <laughs> so, so sure, right, COVID-19 has reminded us that the things that we said couldn't be done can be done, mm -hmm. right? Um, as recently as a couple of years ago, I was teaching a, a group of medical students and I challenged them because I said, you know, the majority of your work, you know, when you all are physicians, um, may not actually be uh, conducted in a hospital or in an exam room. And they're like, well, what are you talking about? On the phone? And I said, no, actually, you know, we'll be using video technology. And this is within the time frame of FaceTime and Duo and all of these tools, right? And they rejected my hypothesis. These were medical students, right, on the bleeding edge of technology. <laughs> and when I parsed why, you know, they were parroting their, their mentors, right? Oh, well, it's too risky. And oh, well, what if you need to listen to them with a stethoscope? Well, we've got digital stethoscopes now that people could stick on their chests. And we have digital otoscopes and even ophthalmoscopes. So, the, so what, what couldn't happen all of a sudden, the second half of March of 2020, you know, 45% of encounters occurred virtually, right? So we know that this is possible. Um, and I, unfortunately, I think there's a pendulum that's swinging back wherein we're seeing less of it, right? Because in many cases, providers are more comfortable doing things the way they've always done them. Um, and so I think, you know, it's upon us to, to us as individuals to continue to exert pressure on health plans to reimburse. And I'm not sure we'll ever mm -hmm. Reachieve parity. I don't. I don't think that parity is necessarily essential. Um, I think it's more convenient for both physicians and for patients. But we need to sort of stay where we got to, um, and I'm not sure that we're going to do that. But anyway, I, Ashima. I think I think you, you hit a couple of points. I wholeheartedly agree. I was hoping I'll disagree with something, but I think I, I'm agreeing. I think a lot of what we've seen post-March, I think that's where there's a common purpose, urgency, and people did things at the speed that I have not seen in like decades in healthcare. I come from Kaiser. I, so it's happened industry-wide. So there's something to be said about having common purpose, the level of collaboration and urgency that COVID created. And I, I hope that doesn't go back. Right? That inertia that sometimes sets in in the enterprise setting, we saw multiple stakeholders come together. So it's not about technology and AI. There were more people willing to take a charge, take risk and apply it and overnight. Telehealth was in the back burner, and now it was like people stood up telehealth for different specialties. So much of it is coming down to our, you know, organization inertia or organization's will to, to really make a change. It's one thing to, everyone wants to innovate, but no one wants to change, right? That's a quote. Everyone wants to, you ask anyone, do you want to innovate? Everyone will say, yes. Do you want to change your practices? I think that's where, you know, it becomes that difficult conversation. So. That 100% degree, I think from AI perspective, as I mentioned before, where telemedicine is going. And then if you look into, and, and you can, uh, the, after the, um, the, the High Tech Act 2009, we have 90% plus EHRs now, like health systems have electronic medical records. 
billions of encounters, patients, what medication has worked for whom, what was the treatment options. Have we leveraged that data for any of the pushing the science and research forward? I would submit that no, it's much more of a billing tool. So we have the data, it's an EHR. We have done amazing and incredible as a nation to digitize and create the, the, this whole digital data lake for the, you know, for 90% of health systems. And yet that data is still selling in silos and it is not used for pushing science forward, getting new treatments, new breakthroughs. I think that's where the opportunity is. So we have the data. And I think that's where when we now will get more patient generated data, when you talk about telemedicine, when you're talking about sensors, these are new modalities that are coming in. And the trick is, and this is a holy grail, we all talk about this total health record. It's not just which is in your EHR. It's your social determinants of health, your behavior, your lifestyle, nutrition, your socioeconomic status. And then now we're talking about, you know, collecting all this new information and, and then creating the right intervention at the right time. And now I would add to that at the right setting, like, not not just not one size fit all like everyone needs a telehealth visit so I, I see a lot of opportunity in learning health system in knowing what type of visits and modality works for what type of patients in future when we think post pandemic so future back future back to me is hybrid like we do that today in retail like i buy a scab from nordstrom i can go and return it we do that for banking, like I can bank online and I can go to the bank. Healthcare, that hybrid model, I think that's where we, we ought to go to. Um, like you give the example of like Whole Foods, they, yeah, I can buy two, two hour or I can go to the store. It's the same stuff. In the healthcare, it's not all telemedicine and all in person. That future is hybrid and digital is going to stay in, but the, our risk is that it should not become one additional modality, which is disconnected, again, not connecting to the EHRs, not being meaningful from the patient perspective, otherwise they won't perceive the value. And the hashtag no rollback of telehealth, I think that's, we need, to, we need that advocacy in, in the industry. We're getting some questions from the audience about, you know, data privacy and security. Um, you know, in terms of these technologies? I mean, where do you see that we've progressed in terms of protecting, you know, patients' data? And where do you still see work to be done in terms of making sure their, their data is safe and secure? Jacob, do you want to take it or I can answer? Well, well we might say similar things, but, um, you know, as a former Fed, uh, I can offer that we've, we've come a long way. Um, as everybody knows, HIPAA um, was not about um, necessarily constraining data. It was about the portability of data and enhancing interoperability. Um, so, uh, and yet also provides very explicit guardrails for what happens with people's information. Um, I, I often see HIPAA invoked, um, uh, un unfortunately, in a context where uh, folks are applying it um, you know, incorrectly and giving it, you know, using it as an excuse to not share. And, you know, perhaps we've, we've all had little uh, experiences with this, um, wherein someone doesn't share. I've even heard of uh, cases where, where uh, data isn't shared with patients citing HIPAA, which of course is ridiculous, right? Um, so I think, A, we will see more consumer-directed exchange, wherein um, technologies exists for it exist and are growing for consumers to aggregate our own information and then share it. And of course, HIPAA permits us to, and in fact requires uh, care providers to share data with us, right? And because HIPAA requires that, we can aggregate it ourselves and then we can protect it. Now, this is the tricky part, right? Just like your banking information that Asha was talking about. I'm not gonna share my login information to my bank with you. Um, I protect that and my bank protects that and it's incumbent on the bank to help me keep that information and the stuff that the information is protecting secure. And I think we also need to look to companies outside of HIPAA 
to behave in a responsible way and to follow a set of guiding principles. And I think this speaks to some of the question um, because the question isn't just about regulatory requirements and you know, security, it's about companies and individuals um, following a set of guidance um, that keeps that information safe. And so you know, we, we need to find ways to um, understand what those safe practices are. We need to educate people, right? So if I've aggregated my information and I plop it in you know, Google Drive or Dropbox um, or Box, notice mm -hmm. I'm not favoring one or any company, um, but now I've got it aggregated, it's in the cloud. Now, how do I keep it secure? Because it's on me. And, and I think this is incumbent on those companies to help individuals keep that information safe um, so that it could be shared, but it could be shared safely and securely. And I would double down on that, Jacob. I think we, we hear that. In fact, this is one of our top goals from Google Cloud perspective to really lean in on heavily on trust. We have seven trust principles which are available on our website and, and we should and better do, do a good job in distributing that. I think there is that literacy part of it, but you're absolutely right. Trust, transparency is critical. So as an example, and I'll use the bank analogy again, when you put the data in Google Cloud, it's like putting in a bank's vault. Like I put my piece of jewelry, I have the key, I go it, yes, it's in, in, in the bank, the locker is provided by them, but I hold the key. Similarly, the data that you put in the cloud from our customer's perspective, it is that vault, it's their Google Cloud bucket, I think that's a technical word, word for it, it's their instance and they, it's encrypted and they have the key. Right? That's the analogy that I use and then the new advances around confidential computing. So not just the data is uh, encrypted at rest and in motion, but even while we're processing it, so if you're executing some machine learning algorithm, even that confidential computing, those technologies are coming uh, and, and are being enabled today. So, and, but those, again, I go back to my bimodal present forward. These technologies are available today. Like in some cases, we see cloud is much more secure. We have whole hundreds of engineers who are trained in our leader in the security practices today. And I can tell you coming from the healthcare industry, well, the security, yes, this it's pretty sizable, but from the vendor perspective, the hundreds of engineers and the luxury we have in guarding that, we use, and those are, because we have our own product like Gmail, YouTube, it's security, it was inbuilt and now we wrapped it and made it available to the enterprises. So focusing on innovation and not just on the infrastructure is a key message for them. But when you talk about, I think you touched on a topic very near and dear to my heart on consumer mediated exchange. And that to me is the future back. In the future, consumers need to have in that consent and transparency where my data is going. The data doesn't belong to the hospitals of the world or the farmers of the world or the tech company. It belongs to the consumers. And I think that data exchange, I, I do see that like, 12 to 36 months from now, the, the ONC rules are paving the way for that, but that's where the future is. That if I'm donating my data or I'm or you're asking for my data for a particular therapy or cure, give me the choice. Give me and I give the consent and I'm in that transparency where the data will be used, I think that will be key. Um, so we are coming up close to time. So I think to wrap up, I'm going to ask, you know, both of you guys just to take out your, your crystal balls briefly and kind of look ahead to, to what, you know, maybe one prediction or, or, you know, a key prediction that you have in terms of where we're going with AI and machine learning in healthcare. <laughs> okay, Ashima, Ashima pause. So I'll, I'll respond because we don't have much time. I have no idea. But um, where are we going? I think we will we will go slower and faster than we expect. And that is to say, um, some of these things are not gonna happen for a decade or two. Uh, we're, we're not gonna get to 20% doctor, for, sorry Vinod, um, for a decade or two. Because as, as Ashma said earlier, change is really hard. Innovation looks fun when someone else is doing it, but changing the practices of how we do our work every day 
takes a long time. So I think that we're not going to shift very fast in many of the ways that we do sort of the day to day. Um, and yet there will be little pockets of innovation where things will change really fast and have already started to. Um, and there will be disruptive companies that come in from the side that we least expect um, that will significantly change the practice of how we do our work and help people optimize health. Just to add to that, Jacob, I would say, and it's been humbling to see the application of AI machine learning in the human productivity side of it. When you talk about you know, claims processing, document understanding, natural language processing. So I, I see greater promise. So there's of course a clinical decision support diagnostics. It's much more difficult, the FDA approvals. It's a, it's a long and arduous path because they're live protocol systems. And then there are ways where artificial intelligence and machine learning can be applied and should be applied in aiding human productivity in the back office. And somehow the back office part of the healthcare sees not the full light of the day. And we are seeing that change, right? The, the productivity in processing the tons of access, document understanding, NLP claims. I think that's where the opportunity is. And when we talk about physician burnout, so anything that you can do or we can do innovators, companies to help either patient remove the administrative burden or for the back office, uh, uh, resources, personnel, or for the physician, I think that's where the greater promise lies. And in, in my mind, is much more practical. Um, and not to say that AI and diagnostic is not important. I think those are little longer term projects in very early uh, um, days there. Well, great. I thank you both so much for, for joining us for this great conversation. And, and thank you again to our audience as well for, for tuning in. Thank you. Have a great afternoon. Thank you, Coach. Thank you, Jacob.